My name is Julian Wilkins, Government Relations and Public Affairs Director for Digicel Group and former Chairman of Canto. I will be your moderator this morning. Our guest speaker is Dion Entaj, General Manager of Digicel St. Kitts and Nevis, and she's going to share her viewpoints on how organizations can innovate, navigate through these difficult times. Dion, welcome to Canto Conversations. Thank you so much, Julian, and good morning to everyone. I hope that you're all safe and sound and that you are surviving these strange times. How are you doing, Julian? Hey, I'm doing, doing well. I'm doing particularly well to see you there on the other side. You're my neighbor, I'm in St. Kitts. Sorry, I'm in Antigua, and mm -hmm. you're in St. Kitts. Yeah, just so across the are. <laughs> So it's nice, it's lovely to see my neighbor. Great stuff. So to our audience, um, please remember to post your questions in the chat and please mute your microphones. So I've got a number of questions for you, Dion, but um, I, I, uh, I wanted to mention, you know, to Canto, and I, I will want to really big up Canto because over the years, they've really been supporting women in ICT and uh, through having events or seminars at their conferences. Um, um, but I think generally speaking, I'm not sure folks realize um, just, just that we do have a lot of strong Caribbean women leaders in our industry. Um, and I can think just looking at the Canto board uh, we've got at least four out of the nine directors are women. Uh, so I wanted to start off with a question on women in ICT, if I may. Uh, so, so Dion, you're actually the third woman CEO that we've had on Canto Conversations. Last right. week, we had um, uh, Nikima Roya John Baptiste, CEO of Digicel Dominica. This week, we had Siobhan James Alexandra, CEO for St. Lucia, did you sell? So, um, so could you give us some of your background and maybe offer some advice to young Caribbean women who are making a career in ICT, in the ICT industry, but if you're also able to break that down in terms of being a woman, leadership, and COVID-19, how do you, how do you, all those three, how do they work? Right, okay, so let me see if I can tackle your question first. So for those persons or those young, um, I would say business leaders and, you know, females who might be interested in telecommunications and or ICT, I'd say go for it. It's one of the industries that's going to transform. It's going to become more and more exciting. It's going to, you know, be an industry where people can grow and develop with technology as we can all see that technology continues to evolve. So I would encourage whether male or female that this is a field to be in, that's the first piece. The second one Julian, I think, hello? I think we've lost Dion. We've lost Dion. Oh, okay. Um, well, hopefully she'll be, you, you're hearing me okay, are, are you? Yes, we're hearing you fine. Hi, hey, Julian. Sorry, say that again. I said I'm here. Okay. Oh, oh, Del Rio, so so good to hear from you, fellow board member. How are you? Doing well, thanks. And All I right, see you're so... doing quite fine. <laughs> 
Yes, yes. Uh, every now and again, we have a little minor hiccup. And I'm seeing Dion right back with us. Dion, great to have you back. Hi, I'm sorry. We had a slight power outage just now. Generators kicked in. All right. Oh. So I'm just going to quickly recap once again, and hopefully it stays stable. Um, we've been yes. having some issues with commercial power here. So basically what I was saying was that um, it has changed dramatic, dr dramatically from when I started, where you would have had to have had a telecommunications background or engineering background in order to That's become right. part of you know, a telecommunications industry or, you know, just acquire a job. That has all changed now. Now you need to have more of a commercial mindset or even just general business. As people are going, as the business is going into more of a digital slash, you know, retail environment, those skill sets are just as important as an engineering background, for example. And mm. obviously one of the things that would have changed over the last couple of years is we're moving away from, you know, landline type of uh, business and more into um, broadband or microwave type of businesses. And so therefore that allows, you know, more experience or exposure to different types of skill sets. So mm -hmm. you don't have to be, you know, cornered into, okay, I need to have an engineering background in order to get telecommunications, or I need to yes. have, you know, a specific type of technical background. Of course, that's all still important, but I think over the years, what has happened is that the business has evolved in such that there's so many different areas that you can become exposed in right now. That's so many so skill sets that mm -hmm. you can become engaged in in order to join the telecommunications piece. And to answer your second question on terms, uh, in terms of being a female and you know being a leader, et cetera, I'll be honest with you and say that it's in, in especially in my environment, it's not an easy task. I'm not going to paint a pretty picture. It's not easy, um, but it's quite doable. If you surround yourself with a very good team, and if you remember that just like you, they're human, and if you get an engaged audience, I'd say that your job becomes easier. It may not be easy, but it becomes easier. And especially as a female, um, we all know that it's a little bit harder on the girl side, to be honest, yeah. in, any, in any business, not just telecommunications. And so it's important that we surround ourselves with strong people. As females, we tend to try to want to do it all on our own because we have to prove a point that we're strong and we can do it. But we're also human. We're mothers, we're wives, etc. So it's very important for us as, as females to surround ourselves with a very strong team and not expect to do it all. I think that that's very, very important, Julian, as a female entering to this business. Because of the pace of which it runs at, we try to tend to just try to, you know, let's just get it done, I'm gonna do it. You'll break down. It's important to surround ourselves with a very good and strong team. You know, I, I've been to your, your office several times and uh, you've got a great team, by the way. And uh, what strikes me is it's quite a young team as well. Yeah. Uh, well, they've got a young leader, dare I say. Um, uh, don't, let, don't, don't let the height fool you. I've got some age. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I know you've also got uh, a fair amount of women working in the office as well. I do. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, during COVID, I'm sure some of them have got children, probably got young children. How have they, have, how, how has that been managed? Um, Right. So I think one of the most important things for us here is to recognize that we're all in the same storm, but we're definitely not in the same boat. So yeah. it's very important as a leader to understand that and to understand that, you know, every single person reacts differently, whether it's female or male, everyone has a challenge. Yeah. So where we would have seen, say, for example, in the U.S., there's some persons actually making millions off of COVID, whereas some are hungry. Similarly here, some of us who have kids, or, you know, became introspective during the lockdowns and said, you know, I need to spend more time with family, et cetera, et cetera. Some of us said, please let some kind of school open just to get out and away from them. And, and, and I think for, for me as a leader, I needed to sit and talk with every single employee and understand what are your challenges? What do you need help with? Sink Kitts went into lockdown very early. So by the end of March, we were in 24 hour lockdown, not curfew, but you wow. had to stay within the confines of your home. And there were, we're small enough and the way that our topography is 
it's very easy to police that, which is why we were able to come out of COVID relatively quickly in terms of becoming COVID free. But that meant that people were challenged, schools were closed, you know, people were at home, they didn't know what to do with their kids. For me, what we did was we prepared from the time we started to see COVID escalating in other countries because we're so, you know, reliant on tourism and, and educational tourism because we have the universities here as well. We shut our offices down very quickly and, and prepped our staff um, to be able to work from home um, very early in March. So before we even closed right. the island, Digicel as a company started to look at um, an emergency measure. So we took our, uh, what we call our uh, emergency or hurricane measures and enhanced that to include COVID. And what we did then was look at every single circumstance. So people who have children, people who are single families, you know, people who have kids who are gonna be staying at home, who don't have uh, school systems, what do we need to do to help them? And we armed them with things like laptops. We, enhance, right. we increased their bandwidths, et cetera. We mm. said to them, look, whatever help you need, let us know. And then in addition to that, we also have people who are high risk. So they're asthmatics. There are people who have diabetes, et cetera. Right. So we had to take a strict, very strict look at every single employee, not just the females. But then even so for our uh, female staff, we are also very aware as businesses are opening again, right now we have our staff coming in in schedules so if we know that okay you need to be at home with your child for four or five days that's fine give us one day for now until we can get something better because it's so important for us to remember that we still have humans working for us we have to drive revenues we have to ensure that we get business back as much as possible but if we can't do that with all our resources right so we need to take care of them and that's what we've strived to do you know, to try to balance, not just for females, as I'm a female, and so I understand, you know, what other females are going through, but for every single employee, it's very important for us to understand the individual needs if we can. And I can do that through a team here, which is small, but for those of you who have a larger, you know, footprint, your HR teams obviously can help with that. And then what was very important, Julian, is every single day, we did what we call huddles, where we touched base with every single employee by department, by company, because it's easy to get lost in the work from home, which becomes mm -hmm. kind of work from TV or work from outside or, 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 and then the focus is lost. It's really yes. important that you are scheduling daily, face on, I need to see you, contact with your staff. It helps to ensure that you're keeping them focused, but at the same time, you're also checking in on their well-beings as well. You're, you're connecting, in other words. That's right. That's so, right. so all of your managers would have uh, had these huddles um, uh, every day then, that's what you're saying. Every single day, every day. So each manager for every department would have their huddles. And then me as GM would have a huddle with my managers. And then we did what we call virtual town halls or meetings at the end of each week just to touch base as a company to, to show that, you know, we're still here and that we're still working and that we're still pushing, you know, the digital business along. I, I you know, um, each week when I, I do these interviews, I'm always fascinated with the different ideas and the different approaches. Uh, it's really good to, to, to have your, your feedback. Um, uh, and, and congratulations, by the way, on being COVID free. That's because the airports are still closed, Julian. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm not going to comment on that because <laughs> I'm just not going to comment on it. But congratulations. <laughs> not many countries can actually say that. And I think that's, that's absolutely... I think that, that honestly, the COVID task force that's in St. Kitts did a phenomenal job. Um, we worked very closely with them as a utility and part of the emergency structure for St. Kitts. And... I mean, they they did every day, non like consistent daily updates to the entire country, focusing yes. on the Ministry of Health. She gave her update on cases and what was happening. They would have guests. So, for example, I appeared on behalf of utilities. Our competitors would have appeared as well. The chief of police appeared every single day. Said these are the amount of people we arrested. If you want to be one of them, that's fine. So I I think that. The task force and the government of St. Kitts really did a fantastic job of, of trying to ensure that the infrastructure remain, you know, 
um, um, quite up and running in, in the face of, of, of something that we never would have imagined this time last year. You know, and I think what's even more amazing about St. Kitts is you just had a general election. In the middle of COVID. <laughs> yeah, and, and you, you're still COVID free. I, I know some countries that have had elections, even in the Caribbean, they've seen a spike. Yeah, um, yeah. I think, I think that it goes right back down because the elections were also managed very well. So you still had to conform to social distancing. You, I mean, even now as we're COVID free, we must have social distancing in part. We are visited by the task force to ensure that, you know, we are COVID free and we remain COVID free based on our practices. So, and I also think the way that we released people back into the, 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 the structure, the infrastructure of Sinkets was also good. So we're still on curfew, whether or yes. not, and we still have to, to, to keep that practice of being safe. You know, we still have to measure temperatures. We still have to wear masks outside, etc. So yeah, right. I think that it's important that we understand we have to drive revenues, but we also know that maybe the healthcare system will, we know that our healthcare system will not sustain a mass outbreak. So prevention yes. for us is better than cure. That's a great, that's a really great, uh, great story, Dion. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn the question now more to the organization, your organization there in St. Kitts. Sure. So how did COVID-19 affect the organization as a whole and, and also your revenue? You know, what was the impact on your revenue? Right. So, I mean, just like, you know, anywhere else that's dependent on, um, that has a GDP that's dependent upon tourism, you know, we would have seen a decline in our revenues, um, especially with the loss of roaming revenue, because obviously people aren't traveling anymore. And then obviously, as persons are more concerned in, you know, saving their wallet, the wallet share has gone down. People are now deciding to, to, to either buy bread or buy recharge. You know which bill yes. do I pay this month? Um, and so it has affected us in that we've seen a decline in our revenues. So what we've had to do is to look at our cost structure, um, just to ensure that our EBITDA could become as balanced as possible. Um, we've done a lot more work in terms of aggressively looking at our daily analytics to see what is the actual area that we needed to target. With all things being equal, you could put a generic campaign in, and you know you can see the um the revenue structures the revenues coming in based on one campaign what we what we had to do was to revamp our entire segmentation process and really look at who are the people that are not spending and why right a lot of persons who would have you know been locked in uh, converted for example to wi-fi um, the digicel business does not have wi-fi in st Kitts. we do have it we don't have a broadband service in wife in st Kitts. we do have it in nevis so therefore we were competing against, you know, two island-wide um, Wi-Fi broadband solutions in St. Kitts, which means then that my data revenues obviously would decline because people are at home and they're sitting on Wi-Fi. Why use your mobile phone? So exactly. we needed to make, yeah, we needed to make your our mobile service relevant. You know, we needed to make it, you know, that customers saw like this is still a product that you have and that you needed to use. We needed to make them feel that this was something that, you know, was important and that it could be part of their everyday life. So what you saw was on days that we had releases, we went extra hard and we saw, you know, a, a massive jump in terms of revenue input versus those closed out days, just like a supermarket. When the supermarkets were closed, there was nothing. And then you had lines curling and curling once they opened. Um, it still it still wasn't enough to get back to where we were trying to, you know, to get to pre-COVID levels, but every single day we're seeing improvements as people are coming out, as people are getting back to a, some kind of semi-norm. We are, we are anxious to have, you know, our ports reopen again, but at the same time, we're also anxious still not to have them reopen because we know that a second wave is possible. So for us, revenues, you know, fell off a cliff in April. And are slowly yes. now back, you know, coming back up in May and June. And we're hoping yes. to ensure that we get back as much as possible and at least replace some of that loss in, in outbound and market share shrinkage, which is what has happened as well with the loss of the hospitality sector. Well, that's right. You've got some uh, fabulous hotels, if I remember rightly. We and do. And, 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 and they're all closed for now. Um, mm. So we know we have a lot of people 
unemployed or laid off, you know, or, or receiving very small government subsidies, which is great. But at the same time, they still need to, you know, pay, you know, eat, basically. So yes. there's this shrinkage. And over in Nevis, they're very dependent on, say, for example, Four Seasons, which basically props up a massive share of the economy. Um, it may not be in direct hospitality, but the farmers, you know, the hairdressers, etc., they're all dependent on the larger hotels. The Airbnbs are all closed. So, mm. you know, it's a wide reaching. It's not just about people not being out and about for digital use. It's the entire economy. I'm mm. sure like with everywhere else. One of the things, Julian, that, that, that we've seen an impact on is that as you're aware, think it has quite a few international universities and those Correct. students obviously would have been flown out you know the u.s tends to bring everybody mm -hmm. out when there's a pandemic or if there's any kind of risk and what has happened though is that they're stuck and most of them have to oh. come back through miami um, or or other hot spots which aren't going to get into sync kit so we have our realtors now who are suffering because obviously the apartments are all empty and our restaurants etc where the students would have been you know yeah, cafes where they would have been you know hanging out etc so it's not easy in terms of what we're seeing in St. Kitts economy wise simply because we are dependent on that you know tourism slash whether it's education tourism as I call it or 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 natural tourism it's it's not easy and and I think for us the the, the rate that we're coming back up for Digicel St. Kitts is really accredited to a strong team who is willing to really push and fight for every single dollar and again, just as how I would have encouraged that at the beginning, it's so important to ensure that the team is engaged because they're the ones that will bring the ideas and then execute them. You know, um, I'm thinking about Antigua. We are still, uh, unfortunately, very much a sort of cash society. And I guess um, most of the islands in, in the Caribbean probably still a cash society. So you mentioned, you know, you really had a, a proper lockdown, as it were, and your, your retail stores would have been closed. So obviously that impacted your, your revenue. Um, but was there, was there any kind of new services or anything you tried to introduce to, to alleviate that problem? Yeah, so we have a phenomenal app called the My Digital app across um, all of our businesses, right? Again, it is credit card dependent. So it is the first thing we needed to do because we also have low penetration for credit cards here was mm. to encourage customers to understand there's nothing wrong with using your credit card with our app so you can purchase your top of et cetera. We also extended what we call um, credit use um, where you can ask us to send your top up, for example. So if you didn't want to, to do this through your card, we right. created local hotlines where we could you could, if you wanted to, uh, give us your credit, your debit information over the phone. We don't write it down and we send it to you instantly. We also did something that was really good. Every single, every single member of our staff, were, we, we made them resellers. So we actually said to them, you go out, you have your community, you have your friends and family. Here you go. Here's our app on your phone. You then become a reseller so that people who know you and trust you you can actually sell to them and that worked really really well but i think one of the things that we saw was there was a massive switch in the mix of recharge towards our my digital app which works phenomenally well um, and people actually tried it out because they needed to get you know recharged to, to use their handsets and then when we actually did open we made sure that all of our retail touch points were also open not just us as a digital store but all of our resellers as much as possible were ready and waiting to go. Our partner here, which is Rams, you know, would have had um, backup recharge, you know, for those days where it kind of flew through the door. So it, it's, it, it was important for us to have a comprehensive and cohesive plan touching digital, touching brick and mortar, touching your partners, touching staff, just so that you could connect all of the dots. Yeah? Yeah, no, and um, it sounds like you know, yes, we've had a challenge with, with COVID, but we've used it as an opportunity to, to bring out some, some new product. Yeah. In essence, makes it more simple yeah. for, for customers. Yeah. And, and another thing was in, that which was important right off the bat is that we fortified our stores with um, the barriers and made them very, um, what we call safe. 
we did that with our kiosks as well. So we encourage customers, like, even if you don't want to go digital, which we are encouraging you to do, which shows that you don't need to come to the store, you can still feel safe if you needed to come to the store. And that's, that was another piece that, that we tried to enforce um, to all of our customers as well. Yeah, that's certainly important. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, your, your network um, and in terms of uh, keeping the critical infrastructure up and running throughout the whole pandemic period. Um, how has that gone for, for you? How... Right, so, so one of the things that it was important was that we activated our emergency planning, which basically is um, as if we were going into a hurricane. So the, the pandemic became one of our emergency structures, uh, emergency, you know, you know, initiatives that we had to, to implement. And of course, a big part of that is our, our, our cell sites, technical sites, et cetera, right? Or mobile sites. Um, we would have, before we went into lockdown, what we did is that we approached it as if a hurricane was coming and that we couldn't get out. We needed to stock up on fuel. We needed to buy extra fuel. We needed to have all of our counterparts, you know, in our clusters and hubs who watch our networks really amped up to ensure that the minute that, that, that anything went down, we could absolutely come back up within a second or so. Thankfully, we didn't have any outages. Another thing was that we had to ensure that we were monitoring aggressively day and night. So a lot of people would have been staying at home, which would have meant that there were sites that were not, there are sectors of sites, I should say, that were not heavily utilized, which suddenly became heavily utilized, for example. We would have yes. seen that there were a lot of persons who were starting to stream, for example, high, high definition videos, which were causing bandwidth sharing issues, etc. So, and, and then we would reach out to those customers and say, hey, you're doing X, Y, or Z. Do you want to do A, B, or C instead? Um, mm. And then that helped a lot because it made sure that the quality of what um, the customers were paying for state stood up despite people were at home because even though people were on Wi-Fi and less people were actually using the network, there was more data traffic happening because people were streaming music. They were, you know, when they did, they were watching videos, they were having video chats, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very, very, very critical for us to watch the network every single cell site by sector to ensure that any kind of alarms that went off we addressed immediately. And of course, we were able to do some, we were able to do a lot of the, the sectoring rework in conjunction with the commission of police who would have, I mean, we were under armed escort. That's how serious the lockdowns were. Even though you had oh. permission, you had to be escorted by the police to go to a site to ensure that you only went to that site and nowhere else. Um, and they were very cooperative with us as well because they, they really understood that, um, you know, telecommunications is a utility. It's a necessity to remain connected to the rest of the world. So excessive monitoring, I would say, was, was our key point to ensure that the network remains stable. And that's interesting that when you mentioned that uh, consumers actually listened when, when we said to them, you know, if you're streaming, you, you know, a lot of traffic, they actually did listen when we spoke to them. Yeah, so we didn't want to just, we're not in the habit of throttling, yeah? So what we did do is that we, we had a call, we made a call and said, you know, you're going to exceed, and, and the way that we put it is not that we're watching you to say, okay, we're looking at what you're doing, but by looking at the traffic, we can see that at the end of the month, they're going to get a bill shock because they're streaming high definition versus just regular. And, and we don't want our customers to be shocked with this ginormous bill at the end of the month because they're staying at home and perhaps not realizing what they're doing is actually hurting them. It helps me because I get the revenue, but I also want the customer experience to be great. So I think that, that customers, you know, appreciated the fact that we were honest with them to say, hey, you know, you are going to have very large bill, perhaps if you continue at this rate. And that helps them in addition to helping us uh, ensuring that bandwidth was, you know, available for everyone. Interesting, very, very interesting. Um, and really, everybody's collaborating. I find, I find that uh, is really good. So, um, just to, just to give you a little rest at the moment, Dion. You know, uh, we've had you talking all this time. Um, I, I'm going to remind our audience: uh, feel free to uh, put your questions into the the chat. I'm seeing one or two of them uh, coming up now. And uh, you know me; I, I always always like a commercial. You know, a commercial break. And um, 
just want to remind our audience that as far as we're concerned, we're, we've got our, we're still looking forward to our AGM. Have you ever been to our AGM, Dion? No, I have not been. So, so, so I, I, I shall ask you. You're to... waiting until I can't travel to invite me to an AGM. <laughs> All of those fantastic Cuba, et cetera. Okay, I'll, I'll come to it. Well, funny enough, you mentioned Cuba. That was our last AGM. I remember. Do yeah. you remember that? And yes. it was in February. So, and I remember meeting a lot of my colleagues, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the regulators there. And there we were in Cuba. Little did we know that that would probably be our last trip. Last for, one for a while. Yeah, yeah. But um, all being well, and God willing, uh, the 7th of February, 2021, is the date we're looking at for our AGM. Okay. And it's going to be held in the beautiful Twin Island State or the Republic of Trinidad. Okay, cool. That, that's one for your diary. Okay. And I don't know, have you, have you been to one of our conferences and exhibition as yet? Not as yet. Happy so, to come. So this as is long as, as long as we're as all things being equal, put me in your calendar. Yeah, I'd love to okay. meet the team. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I'm going to remind you anyway, right? But just, that's fine. That's fine. Just to mark your calendar is the 25th of July. 25th of July. 25th of July, uh, our conference and exhibition, and it will be in Miami. Okay. So. All right. All being well, it would be nice to be actually have some face-to-face -face meetings once again. Yeah. Uh, so let me just see if I can pick up uh, one or two questions here. Um, and this is from uh, Lucretia Williams. Uh, she says, hi. Hi, Dion. What is your opinion in regards to digital transformation and COVID? Mm -hmm. Do you think it might decrease the digital divide? Some, some since kids are being given access to free Wi-Fi and technology like iPads and tablets to help them at school, etc. Right. You think? Yeah. So two things really on that one. One is totally get that. I'm not certain how traditional education or schooling will happen in. I don't think for the rest of the year. Right. I do have a son who had to do online learning from around February. And um, what I found was two things. One was hats off to teachers across the entire world because it was tough. Mm. I had to become a teacher with him. And yes. secondly, at his age, which is under the age of, he was, he's seven years old. The, 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 the school had to actually rethink a couple of times how to actually teach that class because it was difficult for them to remain focused after for the full eight hours of the day. So schooling actually decreased and, and there was a decrease in screen time down to 1 p.m. simply to keep yes. mental capacities going and to get, you still, they still encouraged you to, you know, if there was a break, let them go outside and run, et cetera. So it's, Lucretia, it's, it's a flip of a coin. One is, one stance will say, I do believe that we will have to continue teaching our kids um, via online for now until we get this under control. And, and I mean, I, I don't really see how it's going to be under control once we, you know, let the borders open and it continues to, you know, to spread or to come back. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you are right with access to Wi-Fi um, and, and devices such as, you know, as you would have quoted, iPads, et cetera. What I saw was our kids are now going to become more digitally aware than they even ever were, than even I am now as a general manager. My right. son can tell you how to completely operate the Zoom platform. In fact, the children were telling the teachers they couldn't understand why they couldn't get it right. After three <laughs> weeks, they were like, but Miss X, Y, Z, you need to. And so our kids are becoming extraordinarily savvy with all digital tools, you know, whether yes. online or whatever is in their hands. That's good and bad. So it's good in a sense that, you know, techno technology is at their fingertips. Um, they, they don't have to go search for it. What I found when I was learning was the search for it was part of the education or learning. The going Indeed. to the libraries, 
the big heavy encyclopedias now they just go ask google so it makes them a little lazier to be honest mm. and i think that we as telcos have to develop um programs at working with uh, device programmers that will still encourage them to think a little bit more because right now we are doing the thinking for them they go alexa what is four divided by six and alexa says x y or z <laughs> versus us with a piece of paper counting carry the three carry the two um so that's the con for it the pro is is that they'll have access to learning uh which they might not have had you know if we weren't this advanced they would have been sitting at home just doing nothing so i think that it's going to have to be lucretia a balance of what we as telcos offer um, and ensuring that it's not just about you know getting that buck but also protecting your future generations to learning in, in in traditional and enhanced ways i think we have to balance both and i think that because most of us have gone through it with our own children we should mm. be able to take that experience and bring it to our workplaces um, in terms of what you've gone through because that's what i'm doing right now I'm, I'm seeing what i had to go through with my son and then i'm thinking of products and services and initiatives to help other parents to do that you know to get that balance yeah i hope that answers your question I, I'm sure Lucretia would be happy with that response since she could always uh, respond as well through, through the chat. Um, and I thought that was really, really interesting insight based on your own experience as well. Yes. That was uh, very valuable. Um, I'm just wondering though, um, like right now you mentioned that you've got staff some staff working remotely, some are in the office, uh, and there's a, there's a roster, I, I guess. Um, but what are you, it'd be interesting to get your opinion, Dion. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see the, the future of working from home, remote working? It's, it's, yeah. How do you see that working out you in see, the industry? The thing is, is that for us as a team, we all want to come back together. Um, we, 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 we feed off of each other's ideas, yeah? So for us, we want to be back in office. That doesn't mean that work from working from home doesn't work. Um, I think that if you have a structured program where employees are doing the check-ins and they are being held accountable to daily performance metrics and they're doing what they need to do, whether they work from home or from the office, it doesn't really matter. Um, right. But it's so important that we have that stringent, you know, kind of procedures or policies in place that you can track productivity. What I've read a lot of is, is you know, across, you know, this is a global um, result of people working from home is that a lot of employers have said, well, hang on, I don't really need all of you if, if half of you are actually producing and the other half are at home. I don't really need you guys. And then you're seeing instances where there are mass layoffs, you know, which is something that what we try to do is repurpose as much as possible. So for our people working in retail who weren't seeing face to face, we set them up behind online stores, for example. So they're still working, but just differently. For technicians who had to go out and install, for example, but couldn't ex install because they couldn't get access to the houses, they took it to as far as they could go and then spoke to the to customers to self-install. So repurposing is extraordinarily important if people want to continue working from home while showing productivity. And it's on us as managers or supervisors or whatever you know, role that's in a supervisory role to ensure that we are keeping a track of what each employee is doing and then actually looking at the output of what they have done on a consistent basis and keeping that feedback going. So I think the future is going to be very mixed. For companies that can enforce social distancing, it will happen. And for companies that can't, they'll have to work from home. I think that COVID is going to be a part of our, unfortunately, a part of our life for a while. And if we don't adapt yeah. and just hope that we can continue to, to stay in lockdown and keep the ports closed, I don't think that that's a realistic out, you know, train of thought. I think that we're going to have to learn to live with COVID smartly, whether it be 
protecting our staff or having them work from home. Yeah, and, and actually, um, I, I wanted to zoom in a bit on, on your retail staff as well, because I would imagine, yeah. you know, being the front line, as it were, um, was there anything special that you did with them um, to, to, to protect them? And Because uh, I know in the early days, uh, when we were reopening, maybe that would have been a bit challenging. Well, the thing is, is that we, we closed the stores very early, right? Um, and we set up our retail staff to work from home and to be online in a kind of retail online environment. So we published local numbers that our customers who would have walked into the store could still reach them, right? And while we were closed on the open days, we were building structures to protect them and to keep them barricaded, right? Um, we would have gotten in a lot of PPE equipment, so it's mandatory within Digicel, one mask per person every single day, brand new masks. So not even the homemade ones, we're actually, we provide that. We do temperature checks every day still, you know, from every single employee okay. walking in, your temperature needs to be checked. Um, mm -hmm. In the early days, we actually had medical personnel across the stores, sitting in stores, just checking. Now we yes. have our front, our front person, you know, they will actually come in. You have to go get that temperature check. Our security guards will give you hand sanitizer walking in. Your customers really aren't allowed to touch common surfaces, but we also put in a regimen of um, hourly uh, sanitization of every common surface within the store. And then we do deep cleaning at the end of each week. And, and I mean, when I say deep cleaning, everything is ripped out and cleaned again. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's a means to make sure that they remain safe but then also the customers remain safe, right? Um, and then, of course, we're still not allowing a full complement of persons into the store. We're still limiting to a certain number coming right. in, regardless of whether or not we're COVID-free. We, we still ensure that, you know, there's, there's adherence to only six people in at a time, and that's it. There's nothing else. doesn't matter how big the store is or what's going on. That is what it is. So I think it's important to protect the staff because they are our frontline people. So we did that very, very early. And then we remind them in our town halls, don't lapse, make sure that you have your hand sanitizer, which we provide for them. Make sure that you have your alcohol, make sure you're wiping your stations down. Make sure that when you're talking to a customer, you are having that mask up or that you're keeping them behind the barricade. Um, that's extraordinarily important, yeah. And, and how has your staff been generally to about wearing masks? Because of course that can be yeah. So, yeah, so we've taken the advice of our um, COVID team where we allow staff to pull it past your nose um, every hour. You can do that or you can right. go into an unoccupied room that has a window and you can actually just open that window, take a break. And just mm. because breathing with a mask, especially if you're asthmatic, is not recommended, obviously, continuously, yes. right? Um, yeah. And so we, we, we give them the steps, okay? You've been there for an hour, pull it down. If there's no customers, of course, please feel free. You don't need to wear it, you know, but from the time a customer comes in, you have to ensure that you're, you're following social distancing. And I think that they understand. They understand that we're trying to protect them, right? It's not like we're trying to be hard or fast. This is for your own safety. And it was important for us from the beginning to get that drilled in. Another thing that we did as Digicel, to not send kits only, but everywhere else, is that we sent daily COVID updates. So there were every single day, emails went out as tips to say, here's what you do if this happens. Here's what we recommended. And it was from staying healthy right down to how do you balance your finances. And that was sent to us every day. And then we as general managers then communicated that out to staff. And I think that that also helped because it made people feel that we think that they're human. Yeah. And we know yes. that they're going through things. So that, that, that's important. And I think that they're very receptive and they continue to adhere as well. Yeah, and, and I think um, what I'm hearing is that we really were connected with, with staff as well um, and, and offered advice because we're all going through this together. Um, and I, I, think, I think you've given some very good examples here. I'm seeing uh, some, some other questions coming up, uh, Dion. Yeah. And, um, Timothy's asking, and well, I don't know if you know this one, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Uh, do you have an application or a plan in place to track visitors when the borders are reopened? Right. So, Timothy, really good question. Our business solutions team actually has, has a service or offering 
which we have actually presented to um, our governments to, uh, which allows us, which would allow them to actually track um, um, visitors as they come in. So it's a it's a it's an app which can, can be put onto their device and it allows them to see it. So it's a it's a an offering from our business solutions team, which is which is available for us generally on. For on the consumer side, what we are doing is that we have specific SIM cards which we'll place into what we call a specific service class that we offer to visitors so that we can tell, you know, okay, you are a visitor because of the type of SIM card that you have. Um, and I think that we would piggyback across what the COVID task force is also going to implement, which I know that they do have a plan in place to track visitors. Um, I also know that for any person entering whenever that becomes possible again, they have to be isolated. So they're going to be tracked because it's not, you know, and it's not a quarantine at home. You have to go into a government facility. So the government themselves are tracking them and then we'll piggyback off of what the government is actually doing. But to answer your question, Digicel does have an application that governments can use to actually track anybody um, in terms of whether or not you're a visitor, whatever they want to do, there's an application that's there. So yeah. Actually, I meant to share with you, looking at the responses, uh, Lucretia said, awesome. Thank you very much to your earlier response. Okay. Timothy said, thank you. That was fantastic. So No problem. Thank you. got you working very hard here. With you. You <laughs> when the borders open, Lucretia and Timothy, come give me some revenue. Come to sync it. Okay. <laughs> yes, I love that. I love that. I love the uh, commercial there. Um, so, uh, a good friend of mine here, I'm not going to mention her, um, but she has a question. Sure. Uh, what role does Digicel see itself with assisting with the new normal, with a more, with a move to more digitization? In point, my senior citizen mother still has to go to the bank and right. stand on the teller line to deposit yeah. funds. Yeah. I have the same issue with my father, who is 75 years old, bless his soul, and he will still yeah. stand in line, even though he can yeah. do it online. So there are two things. One is, I'll, I'll refer back to the My Digicel app again. It's extremely straightforward, all right? Senior citizens are not. It's just click, push a button, and it takes you to any single thing that you want to do. What yeah. we've been doing in St. Kitts is we've been trying to do a lot of education drives and campaigns um, and getting into those, especially rural areas where some of the more senior citizens are that will get into that bus and drive into town to come down, to stand in the lines, et cetera. We, are, we have developed that app specifically for that, right? It's extremely straightforward. Now, the, the, the challenge or the piece behind it is they're not gonna want to use very quickly the card piece, all right? But I think that if for me, for my dad, what I did was I put my card onto his app back home. So mm. he doesn't have to do anything. You want to buy a plan? Just go buy a plan. And it keeps hitting me, right? Yes. Um, and that's, that's something that we do for, for, for some of the older persons in terms of we would encourage the younger ones to actually just, you know, use their cards if they want to so that their, you know, moms and grandmoms can just press that and then go ahead. The other thing that can be done is we have what we call credit advance, um, credit advance, what we call system, where if you are out of credit uh, as, an, as a senior, you can ask me as your daughter to send you credit. Yeah, and yeah, I can yeah. send you the credit from my phone um, um, to, 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 the, to the senior person. Yeah, so that allows them to stay you know, at home while still enjoying the service as possible. Of course, the other option would be is to find um, what we call the postpaid plan. So the plans that you pay for each month where they don't have to be struggling with top up, right? Where they're, they're already, it's just a matter of a bill payment. And again, you can pay the bill as the daughter or the son um, for them and their system, their, their, their service remains consistent and it's always on. So those are some options that I would recommend for us. And we've made it very easy for persons with prepaid phones to actually continue to stay online. And even if you don't want to use our app, which I can't imagine why you would want to, you can do it via, um, if you do have a laptop, you can go onto our website and do the same thing as well. 
Um, but I think that the My Digicel app, which we have, which a lot of our customers use specifically for that, you can buy your top up, you can buy your plan as well, and you can do it all online without actually even leaving your house. It, that, that's an option that I would say that Digicel has spent a lot of time and energy on. We actually revamped it last year and you can shake your just literally every Saturday, every single person who has a plan, do this and you have a chance to win, just shake your phone. And the app itself gives you groceries, it gives you data, it gives you credit, you know, just for shaking your phone with the My Digicel app. So it's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic off product offering that we have, which is part of a larger suite of digital products that we're going to be bringing shortly, that I think that people need, 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 need to, to, to use. I think Julian, you know, tell me who that customer is or person is, and I'll call them directly and put it on, get it onto their phones for them. I, I love that. I love that. that, that that's fantastic. Um, uh, and also, I think um, you've, you've shown that, that we do care about our senior citizens, and there are, there are solutions uh, for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you've given a, a really good example. Um, we, we are getting close to the, the time. I've really uh, enjoyed our conversation, um, but we're going to try and just squeeze in uh, one or two more questions. Sure. It's from a, a quite a famous young gentleman. He's the chairman of Canto, David Cox. And he says, uh, I have a question. What role does Canto play for operators like Digicel? How does the how do you, Dion, think of Canto? How do you think Canto can assist the industry at this time? Right. So, so one of the things that I think, and David, thank you for um, that question coming in. I mean, just working with, with uh, Julian, for example, he is my sounding board when it comes to anything Canto. Anything that I need in terms of help for that may take a regional push I go to Julian. So, so for me, David, having that direct link via Julian to Canto in terms of getting, you know, ideas that other markets are doing. So for example, just this experience helps because then we can sit and hear what the other markets are doing. I think what Canto can do is to keep us connected and keep other industries connected as well, because some of the ideas that are coming from Canto can actually help our economies of scale. Some of the ideas that we're putting in to keep our retail arms working can help the average mom and pop shop. So having access to a regional perspective through persons, for example, like Julian who sits in Canto, um, helps me a lot. And he feeds a lot of information into me that he gets coming out of the seminars and AGMs, et cetera. And I think he also keeps a, a temperature check based on experience or what's happening at a regional level that I can kind of, um, I don't know, morph it into St. Kitts in terms of ensuring that um, what we put into the market is aligned with what the other Caribbean islands are doing in, in, in essence. And then also if I need help, that I know that there is a body or an arm there that can help us as well through, you know, I would say a regional muscle more or less. So I think that it's important to have Canto or have some kind of engagement with Canto on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, because especially during COVID, connectivity across regional touch points is extraordinarily, you know, important. We aren't going to be able to travel. We don't know what's happening with, with Liat, etc. So having a digital connection and a continuous engaged connection is so important, David. And I thank you guys for actually doing this because this actually then gives a forum for us to hear what everybody else is doing. And I'm stealing ideas as I go along. I should let you know. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. It's really good to, to get feedback from a general manager in the region. You know, um, it's really good to get that feedback um, sure. because it's, it's challenging for Cantor as well, trying to navigate, yeah. uh, trying to add value to our yeah. members uh, during this very strange time. So yeah. uh, it, I really, really do appreciate uh, your feedback. Thank you very yeah, much. You're welcome. And thank and, you. Um, I, I basically, I'm going to wrap it up there and say, um, Dion, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. I know uh, I've been to your office. 
you are extremely busy. And uh, I just really, really appreciate that you spent an hour with Canto and with our audience. I really thank you so very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciated talking to each and every one of you. Perfect. So to our audience, uh, just remember our next webinar will be on Tuesday, the 7th of July at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Siobhan Redhead, CEO of Digicel Grenada, who will give her and share her perspective on insights on leading her company through the crisis and on the future of telcos post COVID-19. So I want to say thank you, work from anywhere, stay safe, and stay connected with Canto Conversations. Thank you so very much.